Hello, everyone. You out there? Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is Rhonda. I'm a hello. I'm a uh, bookseller at Belmont Books, which is an independent bookstore located in Belmont, Massachusetts, just right outside of Boston. And it. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are so excited to welcome our two fabulous authors, Christina Soontornvat and Erin Entrada Kelly, uh, who will talk to us about their new books, uh, A Wish in the Dark and We Dream of Space. Both books are staff favorites at uh, Belmont Books and are fantastic reads that will really touch your souls and make you laugh and cry. They did for me. Um, both. Um, the, these two books are very different. One's a fantasy, the other's historical fiction. But each book is about the wishes that we have for ourselves, our families, and our communities. So before I introduce the authors, I'd like to share a wish that we at Belmont Books have for our community, and then also tell you about a few upcoming events. So in the darkness of the pandemic, we at Belmont Books wish that all kids have access to books, great books like A Wish in the Dark and We Dream of Space. With schools closed, libraries closed, bookstores closed, access to books has been very challenging for many kids and families in our community. So we decided to do something about it. And we started a book donation program that we call Read It Forward. And with the the support of Candlewood Press in Somerville, shout out to Candlewood Press, um, and the generous support of our customers. This spring, we were able to distribute 1,000 new books to students uh, who receive free meals through the Belmont, Arlington, and Watertown Public Schools, and also through the Waltham uh, Boys and Girls Club but we want to do more. So if you share our wish for our community, if you believe that all kids should have access to great books, please consider donating to Read It Forward if your families are able to do so. You can use that, that shiny green button. It says buy books, donate uh, at the bottom of your screen to make a donation to Read It Forward and also to buy your own copies of A Wish in the Dark and We Dream of Space. So I also want to tell you about a pair of events we have in August with more amazing um, middle school writers. On August 12th at seven o'clock, Belmont Books will host an uh, event with Meg Medina, who will talk about her uh, 2019 Newbery Award winning book, Mercy Swatis Changes Gears, which is also a read aloud title. Uh, Meg will be in conversation with our own Sarah Marie Jetty, who is the author of What the Wind Can Tell You. And she's also a fourth grade teacher at the Thompson School in, Arling in, uh, in Arlington, Massachusetts. She's also the facilitator of our middle grade book club, uh, which meets each month on Saturday afternoon. And on Saturday, August 8th at one o'clock, the book club will be meeting to discuss Mercy Swartis Changes Gears. To register and to find out more about these events, please go to our website at www.belmontbooks/events. So just a few protocols before I introduce the authors. Don't worry about turning off your webcam or microphone. You can see us, but we can't see you. Uh, we want to hear your questions, comments, and ideas. So anytime during the presentation, please use the ask a question, uh, uh, icon to at the bottom of your screen to write your questions for Erin and Christina. Please be respectful of one another in your questions and your comments, which should relate to the books and to the authors. Um, we uh, The authors may answer your questions as they come up, or we may do that at the end. We'll see how it goes. Um, as I mentioned before, you can use that shiny green button at the bottom of your screen, buy books, donate. Uh, to purchase your own copies of A Wish uh, in the Dark and We Dream of Space. If you are a student, please check with an adult before buying or donating. Um, so now let me introduce uh, and tell you something about the authors. Christina Suntornvat grew up behind the counter of her parents' Thai restaurant in a small Texas town with her nose stuck in a book. 
She's a storyteller, an engineer, and a STEM educator. She spent 10 years working in the science museum field where she designed exhibits to get kids excited about science. Is that cool? Um, Christine is the author of the fantasy middle grade series, The Changelings, and the early chapter book series, Diary of an Ice Princess. A Wish in the Dark, her most recent book, is a dazzling fast paced adventure that explores the difference between law and justice and the power of protest and community to affect change. Erin Entrada Kelly has been writing since she was eight years old. She's the award-winning author of six novels, including Hello Universe, which won the 2018 Newbery Medal. Her books, including Blackbird Fly, Go, You Go First, and The Land of Forgotten Girls, explore themes of bullying, otherness, acceptance, kindness, and empathy. We, we were thrilled last September to have Erin visit us in Belmont for her first fantasy novel, Lalani of the Distant Sea. Erin identifies as Filipina American and lives in Delaware outside of Philadelphia where her new novel, We Dream of Space is set. It's a heartening story that explores the hard yet hopeful lives of three siblings, all in seventh grade, all dealing with adversity in the lead up to the fateful space shuttle Challenger launch in 1865. So a big welcome to Christina and Erin. All right, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you Yay. so much for having us. <laughs> yes, thank you for having us. This is really exciting. Okay. Oh, I can't hear you, Christina. Are you muted? How's that? Did Wait. you did you there you go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> you may not speak. Uh, no, we, we hear you now. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you. I love your books. I love Leilani of the Distant Sea. I love We Dream of Space. So I have so many questions for you. Yes, and I have I have a myriad questions for you as well. So everyone, before, before everyone uh, joined, I was joking with Christina because she mentioned that whenever she's on a virtual event, there I am like asking questions in the chat. So I've been going to a ton of author events, but especially Christina. So I'm like popping up, you know, like, hey, <laughs> I'm at this event again um, because I love A Wish in the Dark so much. So I kind of wanted to, do you mind if I just start asking you stuff? And then yeah, you no, stuff? Wait, okay. does everybody know, does everybody know what the books are about? Do we need to talk about that or should we just jump into it? Maybe we should. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about that. You tell us a little bit about uh, Wish in the Dark. Yes, okay. good oh. idea, good plan. <laughs> I'll just I agree. Yeah. A, a Wish in the Dark is about a boy who's born in a place that's pretty much prison and he escapes from the prison his big dream, his dream is to be free, but he really wants to like make the world a better place. Um, and he escapes, he hides out in a Buddhist temple for a long time. And he uh, he thinks that he's hiding forever and no one's ever gonna find him. But then the prison warden's daughter does discover him by chance and becomes obsessed with hunting him down and, and returning him to prison. And so there's this big chase and in the in the midst of the chase they discover that their city is on the brink of a revolution and there's a lot of choices to be made there but yeah, yeah. that's just quickly what it's yes about. That, that was very good uh, <laughs> you're well when people ask me what my book's about i'm always like uh i don't know <laughs> <laughs> it's about stuff okay so <laughs> this is we dream of space and it is set during the month of january 1986 in the weeks leading up to the Challenger disaster. And even though the Challenger is kind of the, the foundation or the, the undercurrent in the book, it's really a book about family. So we have um, Fitch and Bird and they're twins and they're both in seventh grade together. And they have an older brother, Cash, who's one year older than them, but he has failed seventh grade. So the three of them are all in seventh grade together. And it's, it's kind of about them navigating. They have a kind of a difficult family, uh, a difficult home life. And it's about them navigating that home life and 
a uh, bird in particular, uh, she dreams of being NASA's first female shuttle commander. So she's very invested in the Challenger launch. Um, her brothers don't care much about the launch. Her, uh, her twin Fitch is much more interested in playing games at the arcade. And her older brother Cash loves sports and hates school. So Bird is really the one who's like super invested in this, uh, this launch. And because their family life is, is difficult and tenuous, um, the three of them are kind of orbiting alone. You know, it, it's, I wanted to explore like what it's like to have siblings, but still feel very lonely and what it's like to be in a crowded house and still feel very alone. So that's kind of, uh, you know, we dream of space. Yeah. I, I felt that for sure. I, I'm an only child. So I, I don't have the experience of growing up with siblings, but I felt like I, I felt like I could know, like this gave me so much insight into it that, and that is the exact, uh, the exact feeling that I got that you could be surrounded by people, but feel like you're com completely by yourself. Um, yeah. And I think we've all felt, felt like that before, even if we don't have like a big family or anything like that. Yeah, um, definitely. Did yeah. you have a big family? Do you have siblings? I mean, I, I theoretically have a big family because, uh, but, but also a small family. So I have a huge family that live in the Philippines and many of them I still have yet to meet. And many of them I did not see a lot of when I was growing up. So I grew up in Louisiana and it was really just the four of us because my grandparents lived in the Philippines. My other grandparents lived in the Midwest. And so it very much felt like a little four person unit mm -hmm. of just us. And you know, in the book, um, there's a part where Bird is, she really wants her family to sit down and eat dinner together. Yeah. And she tries, but it doesn't go over well. And someone asked me in an event yesterday if, if that was like from life, because in the book, Bird is surprised when she goes to her friend's house because they sit down and eat dinner. And she thought that was something that only happened on TV. And that mm -hmm. comes from my real life because I, I thought that that wasn't really a thing people did. I thought it was just kind of like a thing that they put in 80s sitcoms. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. My family never sat down to eat. I mean, my family is very different from this family, but we never sat down to eat together. So yeah, do you find either? Oh, you didn't either. So you get yeah. it. Yeah. I, I actually think that was kind of like an 80s kids thing. I didn't, but you know, when, when bird goes to her friend's house and it's like, such a clean house and it feels like they have everything together and they sit down and eat together and people are talking i definitely like that struck such a chord with me my my family wasn't like birds either but just the feeling of like oh my gosh our family is doing everything wrong this is how it's supposed to be and like you know the the just longing for that and you knowing that you're never going to get that, that just resonated so much. That felt so real. Thank you. So, <laughs> and I think we all have that moment where we're like, we see something different and we're like, wait a minute. My, the way my family's been doing it, I thought was normal, but it's actually done in a different way in other places, which I think is just an interesting moment, you know? So how much of your, your, you know, personal life, I mean, you wrote a fantasy obviously, but there's still things, about Christina that weave their way into this book, I'm sure, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the, the setting, the world where the book is based is based on Thailand. Hey, Ron, I hear, we hear you. <laughs> Don't say anything questionable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you listening? The whole thing will just be us listening to Ron. Um, <laughs> we are writers, so. Um, no, my, uh, yeah, so it's it's based on my dad's uh, stories of growing up in Thailand um, and specifically growing up in Bangkok. But, I mean, uh, just so a lot of the characters are, are drawn from people that I've met. Um, his, Wong's best friend, the main character's best friend, is based on my dad's best friend um, and their relationship. And um, the the there's a kind of like a revolutionary leader in the story, and her name is Umpai. Um, she's named after my aunt, but she's kind of like a, a conglomerate of like just really 
strong, badass Thai women that I've known. Um, you know, Thailand's like a real patriarchal society in a lot of ways, but women are like just the bedrock of their families and communities there. So, um, so she's based on that. But out of all of the people in the book, I'd say the the person who's most like I put most of myself into was Nook. So she's the prison warden's daughter, and um, her like when she starts off in the book, she has a really narrow uh, worldview. She's just, she really has never questioned like her own privilege and her own life. And she's just sort of always gone along with the story of like, well, the law is always right. And you have to follow the rules. And if you follow the rules, you're a good person. And if you break the rules, you're a bad person. And she never, she start begins to question that and change throughout the book. And that's based on, you know, kind of like a big, a big realization that I came to and um, when I was reading uh, Les Miserables, which is the book that A Wish in the Dark is kind of based on, a twist on. And it's so timely too. I mean, for what's going on. I mean, it's always timely, those those kinds of issues of privilege and classism. and But now it's kind of like at the forefront of conversation, you know? And one of the things that I love about Pong's character is I love that he's that he's very kind and compassionate, but still formidable. So, you know, that's that's what I've been telling people is that, you know, we, we think of kindness and compassion and empathy as, as some kind of soft characteristics, you know, and, and it and we equate it a lot of times with quietness or meekness, for lack of a better word. But right. he's none of those things. So he he shows that you can be kind and compassionate and still be a very dynamic uh, presence. That, oh, that's what resonate. That's what I liked about about him. That resonated with me. Oh, I love that. I like that a lot. Yeah, I. I'm, yeah, same, same thing. I, I feel like when people talk about, especially like in politics, when people are are you know political leaders are talking, and it, that that idea of being compassionate, it's often equated right with being weak. Um, yes, being too soft. So you can either be compassionate or you can be strong. Um, and that's absolutely just not true at all. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Definitely. <so> good. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like he, you know, he really illustrates that. And another question I had, uh, and maybe we could both talk about it, is like, so there's theme, hope, themes of hope of course, are prevalent in middle grade. And we have someone asking, Jamie, what's the most satisfying thing about writing middle grade books? And I think, you know, for me, one of the satisfying things is that middle grade books are infused with hope, even though there's a lot of sorrow and heartache involved in it. Um, so I'm curious if, if writing this book was like therapeutic for you or cathartic in any way, you know, channeling anger about what's happening around us? And did you find it hard to write about hope or were you, or did you find it easier because of what's going on, if that makes sense? Yeah, um, well, I started writing, I, I got the idea before 2016 and we all know what happened then, um, but that's when I was like writing, it was right in the heart of right after the election. And no, no, it absolutely has helped me to be thinking about ideas of compassion and to just, not just thinking about them like as an adult, but thinking about them in ways of like, uh, knowing that one day I might talk to kids about it. And like, how, what do I want them to know? What do I wanna one day like discuss with them like at a school visit? That was really, really helpful. Cause I, I really feel like for middle grade readers, and I, I don't know if you feel this way. I, I, I'm sure that you feel this way because your books are never like teachy. They're never like didactic. Um, but I, I never feel like I need to give my readers anything. Like, I don't think I need to teach them something. Like, I feel like they have everything. They already are perfect in so many ways. And like my job, I think, is to just like, tell them yes like you already know what it is like here's here's some a story that can help you like be sure that what you think is really true like you know kids are so kind they they already are so compassionate like here's a story to let you know that that is the right way to be you know you know what I'm saying? yes definitely yeah you know and i and i say that a lot um 
when I teach and I'm what I'm teaching students who are writing for middle grade or young adult, you know, one of the things is that we should always remember or even adults, not just people writing for them, but that that they are complex three dimensional beings as they are mm -hmm. at any age. They're complex and three dimensional, even at age two or three, they have very no matter what age they have very strong beliefs and ideas and they may seem ridiculous to us as adults but we also had those same ideas and beliefs when we were that age and it's important to know that um they're already they're not empty vessels for us to like put all all our knowledge into them you know mm -hmm. they already have it so we are here to um you know my hope is that when a kid reads a book, whether it's my book or anyone's book or your book or whoever, like during that period of time they're with the book, they're like, oh, I'm not alone in this world, right? Because being a kid is such a lone, it can be very lonely experience because mm -hmm. you have all these feelings and thoughts and you're confused and maybe you don't want to ask your peers because that can be scary because, yeah. you know, they may, judge you you don't want to be judged you want to fit in and books are one way to help tell them you know like yeah. yes there there are other people doing these things or thinking these things or feeling this way i mean yeah. it's just incredible yeah yeah i and um another one thing i loved about your book is it reminded me that this age like middle school the middle grade age is where you start to realize that oh the adults like actually don't know what they're doing like they don't have everything figured out like they told us that they did <laughs> you know like you start to see like uh like in you know their family you can see the cracks in the the way they view their parents like they're they're almost parenting their parents they're they know what's coming from their parents before you know before they get in a fight or before they have like a huge blow up with each other um and that yeah, that that to me is another like hallmark of middle grade is like you're just starting to realize that that you're going to you are going to have to do a lot of things on your own. Like you're going to maybe you'll have help. And in and we dream of space. There are adults who are helping like the teacher. Uh, what was her last name? Miss Salonga. Salonga. Um, and uh, yeah, but there's going to be so much that you're going to have to like leave the nest and do all this by yourself. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's kind of what I was thinking whenever I wrote the book was one thing that that is that always irritates me about adults is that we can be so hypocritical. And there comes a time when kids discover that that's true. And then if it's not acknowledged, a lot of resentment, which is kind of what's happening in We Dream of Space. The, the kids, especially Fitch, who has like explosive anger issues that he doesn't know why he has them or what to do with them. He's starting to really resent his parents because he's starting to see that they're, they're teaching them, oh, you can't use bad language. You have to be kind to one another. Mm -hmm. But then when they speak to each other, they're cruel and they use terrible language. And I think that kids know, oh, I know that kids know because I saw it when I was a kid that mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Sometimes uh, parents and sometimes grownups are hypocrites. And sometimes we operate under this do as I say, not as I do mantra. And I think for kids, that's it's very confusing and it can lead to a lot of uh, disrespect and resentment and confusion. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one of the things that I wanted to explore, too, in the book. So I'm glad that resonated with you as a reader. Yeah, for sure. I feel like we both have adults in our books that are like um clueless yes <laughs> are, I, and we did that on purpose <laughs> it's because we are clueless no uh <laughs> and it's like yeah. i i always that that's me that's i love that middle grade novels where like the kids are on it and they know exactly what's happening and you're seeing it through their eyes and then the grown-ups are just like oblivious um yeah that was that I, I had a couple couple grown ups in the book too that were that was their purpose was to show that they yeah. don't know what they're doing. <laughs> right. Cause because often, you know, especially from a perspective of a 12 year old, um, 
you know, that's how they view the world, like you said. And we have to write through their point of view. We have mm -hmm. to be able to see things through their eyes. Mm -hmm. So, and that's kind of the, that's the goal, right? Yeah. You, you have a question here from somebody, Maria, who asks about the Challenger accident. And that's also a question I had. Why, why oh. you that story? Yes, thank you, Maria, for that question. And if anyone else has questions, don't forget to put them in the Q&A. So um, I did, I did not see it live because my school did not show it live. Um, probably because we did not have the resources. Um, so I saw it later on. I, my memory tells me that I was homesick that day. But one thing that I learned from writing this book is that people's memories unless they were at school and witnessed it live are not um, reliable. So, but in my memory, I was at home sick and I remember coloring in a coloring book and sitting, I was sitting down at the coffee table because I was nine years old and I was coloring and I remember seeing it explode or disintegrate. And I remember thinking, I was by myself, so I didn't have anyone to ask, but I remember thinking, is that supposed to happen? And I think I had a character, I had someone ask that in the book too. Oh yeah. Because because I was like trying to yeah. figure it out. And I'm sure there's, you know, other people who saw it, young people who were like, wait, is that supposed to happen? Because you you don't expect it to happen. So and I picked it because I knew I wanted to write a book set in the 80s, because as a kid who grew up in the 80s, it's of course the, there's the nostalgia factor, but it's also the first major news event that I could remember from my childhood. And what's so interesting about it is, you know, we didn't have the 24 hour news cycle. We didn't have social media then. So um, most of the people who saw it happen live were school children, right? It wasn't, oh, yeah. a lot of adults didn't see it live. A lot of adults saw it later on the news because it, you know, it was everywhere. And I just thought that is so interesting. And it left such yeah. a mark you know, because I remember the excitement and, and those of us who are around in the 80s, we can remember the excitement of of this big launch that's going to happen. It felt like that's what everyone was talking about. It was in, on the news and it was the whole big thing. And then to see that happen, um, it, it just it leaves a mark. You know, you don't you don't really forget it if you were in the States at that time and you're watching it, especially right. if you're a young person, because you can't really connect. I mean, Bird connects with Judith Resnick, one of the, the other female astronaut on the ship. Mm -hmm. But I feel like um, a lot of young people, maybe astronaut feels like a big far away job, but mm -hmm. a teacher is something that all kids know. And so that made it even more difficult to understand. Yeah. So, and, and the fact that Bird's teacher had, tr had almost, well, I, we don't know if she almost got in, but in my mind, I was like, you were almost supposed to be on there. Um, yeah, that's it's it's like uh, it has to be a time of like loss loss of innocence like like this the same thing that we were talking about that like the you, the adults cannot tell you everything is going to be okay like maybe not everything is going to be okay right like there's a moment where I think they're learning that in this really powerful terrible moment yeah. And, and I think that's the scary thing is we want, as adults, we want everything, you know, most of us, I should hope, want everything to be okay, but but there's an understanding that it's not, you know, of course that's not guaranteed. So then yeah. what do you do with that information? Especially if you're writing for young people, what do you do with that information? So mm -hmm. um, that's a big, that's a thing I think about a lot. Like. If I'm feeling if I'm feeling unoptimistic about the world, which is easy to do, especially right now, um, I have to make sure that um, I still connect with those those themes that we were talking about. Hope, because mm -hmm. because you can't really write a, a, a book for middle grade readers that doesn't have that and they deserve that yeah. and, and it needs to have that. But it yeah. can be hard, right? Sometimes when you're feeling when you're looking at the world and you're feeling hopeless. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I really feel like writing for kids is getting me through so much. Like, I, I don't know what I would be doing if I didn't have that. I think I, 
I think having to write about hope and having to write stories that are up that are going to lift them up uh, does the same thing for me. Um, yeah, I don't know yes. what I would do if I had a different job right now. <laughs> I know, and you know what's interesting is, so I had all this travel that I was gonna do for Redream of Space and the book tour and all that stuff, and it got canceled and everything was terrible. I mean, not because of that, the world was terrible, COVID, everything, we all know what's going on. So um, I started getting invites to do virtual Zoom visits and such, and I was so nervous because there were so many terrible stories out there about, um, Zoom visits, you know, and uh, young people being cruel to each other. And I was nervous. And I go on to, to my first one, and it was 200 kids on this Zoom call. Oh my God. And I'm like, okay, we're going to see what happens here. And I have to tell you, first of all, well, first of all, the chat opened. And before it started, they were chatting and they were talking about where they're going to put their toilets. And where should I put my toilets? And I was so confused <laughs> until I figured out that they were talking about Animal Crossing. <laughs> I was like, why are people building toilets? Like, why is that a thing that kids are doing? And then I found out it was Animal Crossing. <laughs> so they're not building toilets. But um, so then I start talking. And in the chat, they use the chat. Now, I think this was in Google Hangouts or something where they couldn't shut the chat down. Uh -huh. And those kids used the chat to feed me compliments the whole time. Aww. It was so sweet. It's That's like, so sweet. I like your jacket. You know, the kids are so like, oh, you're so funny. Oh, this is so fun. I mean, the thing that I love about young people is they're honest to a fault. I think all of us on this call know that. Yeah. And you meet them and they, they're not afraid to tell you exactly what they feel or think. They haven't learned yet to be disingenuous or inauthentic, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I love about writing for young people is that, yeah. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I love that too. You know, I whenever I go to school visits, um, you know, and this is nothing bad about the teachers, but the teachers are always very concerned with like, when, okay, when you raise your hand, it should be a question that starts with, Oh, you know, who, what, why, when, where, but like, I actually just love it when they like, just tell me something totally random, you know, like I am, it's so, it's actually okay with me when they don't ask a question. Cause I, I agree there. I just love hearing what they're saying. And, um, and I feel like kids today are, I, I, I don't know, maybe this is just like, um, like my inability to remember and I'm only remembering certain things, but I feel like kids today are kinder and just more more empathetic than than they were when I was a kid when I was growing up. Like I'll be at school visits where they'll, you know, they'll say something to like boost each other up. Where I I feel like when I was in school, it wasn't cool to be kind to other people. Like you were always trying to like say something to knock them down. Like the kids in We Dream of Space, like like um the friends who are always they're always ragging on each other. Like that's what I remember. And I feel like now kids are a little bit different. Like there's, there's, there's just so much more about anti-bullying and um, they're more inclusive. They're more exposed to different types of people and different types of stories. So um, yeah, I, I love writing for this age group and interacting with them. I hope that's true. I, I find that too. I find a lot of mutual support whenever I go like amongst the students themselves, mm -hmm. which is very energizing, you know, yeah. Um, so I hope that's true. And I'll say, I'll say this too about the questions. Cause that was a really good point with school visits. Um, I go to school visits and I tell them they can ask me anything that they want. And the teachers are always terrified <laughs> <laughs> and I understand why I do. I totally understand why. And they'll raise their hands and they'll say like, how old are you? And the, the teachers are like, <gasps> or they'll say, how much money do you make? And the, you know, the teachers are like adequately shocked and embarrassed, but mm -hmm. I am like, you can ask me, I, I believe in supporting inquiry. And if I say you can mm -hmm. ask me anything you want, I mean that you can, you know, if you want to ask me how much money I make, if you want to ask me how old I am, you can. I mean, mm -hmm. this is like, I said to ask me a question and 
those are the questions that they're curious about, you know? And yeah. so, but what's funny is another, I can't remember who, but another author told me that the best answer is to have them guess how old you are. And they are all too, ha they are all too happy to do it too. So when they ask me how old I am, I say, how old do you think I am? And I'm like, I'm not kidding. At one school visit, this kid goes 21. And then he says, no, no, 60. <laughs> Kids have no concept of how no old concept. adults are. They have no concept, but when I tell them, they're always horrified. They're like, oh, they're like, I'm, so, they just look like they're so, they feel so sorry for me. Like, I'm sorry, that is old. You're not going to be around much longer. <laughs> yeah, no, they're the best. Um, yes. So, okay, I have a question about the ending of your book. Um, yes. And I'm not going to give it away. I'm not going to say what it is because if you haven't read it yet, the ending is perfect. And it's like the, the, it's like, uh, I can't remember what the word for it is, but it's like you, when you read it, it feels like it was inevitable, but you didn't expect to see it coming. Like I really, I, I was, I was like, 10 pages away from the ending. I was like, I have no idea how she's going to do this. <laughs> but when I got there, I was like, this is so such the perfect ending. So I was wondering if you have the ending in mind when you start and how did you get there? Because you didn't tie everything up like neatly in a little bow and it's like a perfect world for these kids, you know? Yes. Thank you for that. That's such a great compliment. So I do struggle with endings a lot because I write realistic fiction where things are hard and it's very difficult, at least for me to say, okay, you know, like, like in Annie, daddy Warbucks comes and they all go to the mansion and they get adopted and that's the end and it's happy. Yeah. But of course we can't do that because we're writing, I want to write honest books and the honesty of the world is that things don't wrap up in a nice little bow at the end. So I struggle with endings for a lot of my books and this one I really struggled with and I had a different ending in mind, which I won't give away, but um, originally, but as the story went on, I realized that that ending would be too saccharine. It would, it would not be realistic. So I had to figure out a way, how am I going to end this where the reader feel closes the book and says, okay, they're going to be okay. Or, or they're on their way to being okay. Um, and I always keep in mind that, you know, my goal is that I want young people to understand the world is not perfect. And here's how you can navigate an imperfect world where things are not fair. And I thought, how can I still do that for them? So I had an idea, which was a little different from my original idea, but as like toward the middle of the book, I thought, okay, this is how I'm gonna end it. And, you know, endings are hard. I feel like endings are tricky. Now I'm dying to know what that alternate ending was. I'm going to text you after this. And you have yes, to <laughs> I will. I will. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of, you know, how it came to be. So I had a question now for you. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about the world building in A Wish in the Dark and this concept of and maybe you can explain for those of for those who haven't read it yet, those poor souls who have not read this book. <laughs> about the lights and i'm curious how that how that concept came to be yeah um okay so the the in um the world where fong lives there the, there is a law that you can't have any fire because there was a really big fire in the city and it just it killed a lot of people and uh it nearly destroyed their city and when everything was in ashes and in ruin, a man came to the city and he had magical powers to create light. And so he kind of like solved all their problems. And in order to keep keep this dangerous fire from happening again, he made a rule that no one can have fire and everyone will get light from him. But he doesn't give it, he, he can create as much of it as, as he wants. So everything is powered by light, like the actual lanterns and lamps, but also like their motors and their machines are powered by him. And um, he, he it's, it's like monetary, like you have to pay for it. So you have to work hard and, and the poorer people in the city cannot afford like the best lights and the wealthier people, um, the, this man's reasoning, the governor's reasoning is that, you know, if you work hard and you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you follow the rules, 
you should be able to afford the best kinds of light. Um, and so like the, the idea of, a mag of magical lights, that comes from my me going to thailand as a kid and it i don't i don't know if you have, have you ever been to bangkok <laughs> no not yet <laughs> you you will go there one day um but i feel like probably and i've never been to the philippines but i i imagine like you know there's a lot of um riverside southeast asian countries and so like these cities that are right on the water and so when you're in bangkok at night the lights in the water reflect the lights of the city. And whenever I'm over there, I'm always really jet lagged and like, you know, <laughs> kind of feeling very dreamy and 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 everything feels a little bit magical. So that I felt like light needed to be a part of it. Um, but also um, I wanted, you know, there, I, I can't, I can't figure out how to talk about this without giving some things away, but light is something that it the governor is not the only person who has the magic to make light and so light is also a metaphor for compassion too and yes that's what i'll say that, like, that's a good way to say it. yeah <laughs> the whole system of like which colors have more power i felt like very strongly that it needed to be like a scientific system that made sense um because I, I feel like in fantasy when things like don't follow like sort of logical rules that it's really hard to believe in it so yes you know what i'm really glad you brought that up <laughs> i'm really glad you brought that up because i feel like your sciencey background to use a technical term sciencey um, yeah I was i felt that in there like you know and it felt it felt real but also fantastical all at the same time i feel like you brought you really brought both of those elements in there Oh, that's good. I mean, that took a while. That took a while to figure out. And my editor would be like, "Does this make sense?" And I would be like, "No, it doesn't. Like, we have to figure that out." But, but yeah, I mean, I think that's why. Uh, like, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but a lot of science nerds are really into fantasy. Like, that's a mm -hmm, get out of here. <laughs> they like play Dungeons and Dragons, and <laughs> um, but I think there's some, you know, like I think the best fantasies feel they're they're so good because they feel real they're built on this like logic even though it's completely made up logic it's like magical logic i think yes, that's it's really important it's like something that you can hang your hat on like something you can point to and say okay that makes sense yeah that's, that's, that's why that's there yeah that's like in in harry potter there are there are some times when someone just like busts out a spell that's like so powerful and you're like there, there are a couple moments where you're like, that doesn't make any any sense. Why don't they just do that all the time, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, totally. I totally that, get that. That drives me crazy. <laughs> so I see a, a, a question from my friend Kate. Hey, Kate. Um, I believe I met Kate. I think it was at Belmont. Kate, I may be wrong, but I think that's where we met. Um, this is a great question. So Kate asks, how hard has it been to have your books come out during this time when it's so difficult for kids to get books. I feel for you because I know if I could book talk these books, they would be flying off my shelves. Thank you, Kate. Aww, so what you. about, what? A, yes, we love you, Kate. Um, what about you, Christina? I mean, yours came out in March, right? So like right in the middle of it, is that right? Like yeah. right when it started? Yeah, right at the beginning. And I think I think my publicist is watching this. And I think I I think I remember talking to Jamie and we are just I mean, she look, she is hi. <laughs> I think mine is on too. And everything was getting canceled. And she had set up like so many events because I have two books coming out. I actually have three books coming out with Candlewick. This year I have seven books that are publishing this year. What is happening? Yeah. What? So I, so I had like, I, I mean, I was, my calendar was just like booked to go everywhere. And then in those weeks, Jamie just sent me an email. I think like every day of like, this has been canceled. This has been canceled. This has been canceled. So it was very, I don't know, it was discouraging, but I, I'll say that, I mean, I, the things that I do hear from readers, um, is that it's a book about hope. It's about activism. It's about making, you know, that every person has the capacity to make a difference. And if you make a difference in just one person's life, that 
can reverberate out and make the entire world better. So I think having a book that's about a topic like that has been, it, it's nice to think that readers are finding that, you know? Um, yes. So that's that's been good. I don't know, what about you? How do you feel about it? I think that, you know what? I, I feel like everyone adapted and, and my publicist is on here too, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> so it's kind of the same thing with Jackie. She had set up all these things and then there's the emails and then it's like, oh, this is gonna be a virtual event now. And you know, everyone's adapting. And I think what helps is that we're all in the same situation. Mm -hmm. So even though it's easy to feel, you know, self-pitying if we wanted to, like, oh, all my things were canceled. In the large scheme of things, it's like, oh, Aaron, you couldn't go on your book tour. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's your big problem right now, you know? So um, I think the fact that we're all in this together, I think it mitigates some of that, you know what I mean? Because it puts things yeah. very much in perspective. And I mean, it's a bummer. Of course, it's a bummer. But but everyone's adapting, like every single one of us, everyone on this call, we're all like figuring out what the hell we're doing with our lives right now. Yeah. So that's just, you know, it's just kind of how it goes. So it's sad. But also, what's cool is things like this have made it um, more accessible for a lot of people. And I've like, you know, like I said earlier, I've been to a ton of virtual events for my uh, author friends and people that I'm fans of. And I wouldn't have been able to do that. You know, obviously I can't travel everywhere to go to everything. So that's one benefit. So if we're looking at benefits, I think that's that's something really great about it. Yeah. But after this, I'm going to expect you to come to every event. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be like, when I'm at, you just pop up, you're like, hey. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I'm going to pop up in the back and I'll be like, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> now, it's Erin again. She's at another one of my events. All over the country. That, I would love that. <laughs> or at a conference, you come into every room. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'm like, Christina, I'm here again. <laughs> um, so good. Yeah. So, you know what? We have a few minutes left. Do you think we should read a little bit? Do you want to read? You know, I don't want to like spring it on you. Should we read from our book? Should we take more questions? You want to do that? Yeah, I, I can do I help. You want to do like something very short? I can do something. Yes. Short. Let's okay. do something short. All right. I have something short too. All right. You want to go first? You go first. Oh, okay. I'll go first. All right. Sure. Um, so this is uh, at the very beginning when we meet Bird, who takes up most of the, the space in the book. Um, and it's The Mood of a House is the title of this chapter. Ten seconds before Bernadette Nelson Thomas opened her eyes, she thought, if there's a five on the alarm clock, it will be a good day. When the digital numbers glowed 2.32 p.m., no fives in sight, she assumed the first day of 1986 would be a toss-up. She shouldn't have slept so late, but she'd stayed awake until four that morning, assembling a new desk for her room. The job would have taken 30 minutes if she'd followed the instruction manual, but 12-year-old Bernadette, Bird as she was called, was not one to follow instruction manuals. She threw it away instead, assembled the desk perfectly, then created a manual of her own. Her stack of schematics was growing, and thanks to the new desk, she now had a safe place for them. After she forced herself out of bed, she walked quietly into the hall. Houses had their own personalities, and Bird liked to know which one she was walking into. She navigated around the hallway clutter, laundry baskets stuffed with clothes, short stacks of books and magazines, a box of old toys, including a Barbie that Bird had never played with, and her brother's plastic toolbox, which she had, and listened as she sidestepped the seemingly endless array of sneakers that littered the house like landmines. Her mother always said she would straighten up once she found a place for everything, but where would that be? They were cramped enough as it was. Her parents didn't even have their own bedroom. They'd converted the small den into their personal space. That too was cluttered. Her parents were talking in low voices. That was a good sign. So Bird thinks they're talking in low voices, so probably they're not arguing, but then she goes and makes a bowl of cereal and they start arguing. Her parents start arguing. So then this is what happens at the very end. As, as her parents are bickering back and forth. Bird looked into her cereal bowl and thought of Miss Salonga, her science teacher. Before winter break, Miss Salonga said the class would dedicate the month of January to space exploration to celebrate the launch of the Challenger shuttle. Miss Salonga had taught them all kinds of facts about space, 
Not that Bird needed to be told, she knew many of them anyway, but the most fascinating fact was that there was no sound in space. Not really. Space is a vacuum, Miss Salonga said. If a piece of debris hits an orbiting spaceship, the astronauts inside would hear it, but someone outside wouldn't. As Miss Salonga explained the process of sound and molecules, Bird snapped a picture together in her head like a puzzle. Then she imagined her brothers and parents inside a spaceship and her outside floating in silence. I love that. So Thank you. I, I love that and that uh, and that you know we dream of space is that they're also dreaming of like literal like their their house is so crowded they need freedom and space and just makes the ending that much better. I'm not gonna say more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and um it, yeah, and her name is Salonga, and that's a Filipina name. Yes. Right? Yes. yes. Uh, is she named after anyone, anyone no. in particular? Not it, not anyone in particular, no. Yeah, that was very cool. I love it. I love birds so much. I did oh, and you have to show your show one of your drawings. Oh, that's right. So Bird does her schematics. She does um drawings so sometimes she draws like how she imagines her family would look as a machine so that's one and then she does uh she did the challenger of course a schematic of the challenger and these are yours right these are mine and now i did not illustrate the this part but the schematics i did and here's here's a blast from the past are we ready yeah i love that one <laughs> a cassette tape and it's the rocky original soundtrack <laughs> So when your kid when yeah. your kids ask what a tape is, you could show them get this book and you could say, see, this is how we listen to music yeah. back in the day. <laughs> yeah, that's so weird. My kids didn't know what a CD was even, so they would not know what a, a tape was. No. Um, okay, I'll read from uh the chapter where Bong escapes from prison. I don't think it's a, a spoiler because it happens very early. Um, so he is, uh, he has a best friend who's more like a brother and the boy is named Somkit and they, they really like lift each other up and Somkit and Bong have just gotten finished cleaning up a pile of durian rinds, which have you ever eaten durian, Erin? Do you eat that? Okay. You're going to have to. We'll have Christina, to I have to tell you, I had to Google that because I was like, is this a real fruit? I had never even heard of it. Oh, they have it in the Philippines. <laughs> You're gonna have no. Her. I never had it there. I have never had it there. Okay. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Well, we'll have to. We'll have to get you some. It's pretty bad. Um. So it's durian tastes good and it smells horrible. It really like it has a smell like like r rotting chicken, like raw chicken in the sun. That's what I think of, or like eggs or something. I don't know, but it tastes really good. So anyway, so Fong is he he realizes he has a way to escape and he's going to escape by climbing into the trash basket which is full of durian rinds and it stinks so Bong froze when he heard footsteps coming closer someone swung open the trash basket lid and held it open for a long time Bong listened but he couldn't tell who stood there was it Somkit a guard whoever it was they shut the lid and walked away Surely some kid would wonder where he'd gone. Surely he would start asking if anyone had seen Bong, but no one called for him and some kid never came back. Bong sat gagging in the basket, stinky juice dripping off his hair and down the bridge of his nose. He didn't know if he could make it until the trash man came back. The whole thing began to feel like a really bad idea. Bong was ready to give up and get out, but now the guards had moved back into position and would see him if he climbed out of the basket. He'd have to wait until sundown for the next shift change. As the sun began to set, the trash man arrived. When Bong heard him whistling, he was seized with terror. He was sure that when the man lifted the basket, he'd realize it was too heavy. Bong's nervous stomach writhed like a bowl of eels. What had he been thinking? He was going to get caught any moment, and then what would he say? Uh, I fell into the basket, you see. I tried to call for help, but no one heard me. Please don't put me into solitary confinement. Being inside a basket of durian is punishment enough. But one benefit of being underfed is that you don't weigh much. The trash man lifted the basket with just a little more effort than usual, 
hauled it to the river dock and plopped it into his boat. Bong couldn't see much of what was happening, but he swore he spotted his friend's silhouette standing at the gate. Suddenly, he realized everything he was leaving behind. No, wait, he thought. I can't go without some kit. But it was too late. The trash man shoved the boat away from the dock with his bare foot, and they were off down the river. Perfect. Yes, see how good it is? Um, so look, we had a question, a very important question about my art behind me. Now, that, look, see, that is me. That was done by a Filipino artist in Boston, actually. Wait, I think he's in Boston. Um, and his name's Bren, and so he did that for me. That's me. And then, of course, speaking of 80s, right, we have Mr. T, who I love. That's Mr. Yeah. T. Yeah. So that's my R. And then I have my books over here is all my books. <laughs> I love it. That's my Ooh. bookshelf back there. So I love this is my writing space, actually. Um, so I love to have art and like bright, colorful, fun things. And I have like some fan. Like This is a fan um, art. You know, when kids draw you things and write you yeah. things. And this is a poem that nobody asked about all this. I just kind of I'm going off on a tangent here. about. I life. love it. <laughs> this is um, this is a poem called Titus the Fish that a, a little boy wrote for me. So I put it in this canvas thing. Aww. So that's my whole. Where do you do your writing, Christina? I actually um, started renting an office right before the pandemic hit, and I wasn't able to go to my office. <laughs> so I started renting the office space right before. But um, but I've kind of figured out a way to be able to go up there when nobody's there. So. Right now, that's where I write. I write from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. in my office and then come back and be with the kids. So that's my that's my oh, time. Oh, and then that's nice. Yeah, and then, like, I'm actually at our kitchen table. This is our, like, kind of living room, and this is the kitchen. Oh, my God, what is over there? Like, look at all that. Look at all that <laughs> crap. <laughs> See, I notice I strategically... <laughs> I strategically stopped my camera before I got to the mess so that everyone thinks that, you know, my whole place is like super cool. But I like how organized your your bookshelf is behind you. It no, likes it's, it's so good. I, and it has like the different nooks and everything. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So look closely. But this is this table is where I wrote um, uh, A Wish in the Dark at this. Oh, I, nice. I wrote a lot of books here while my kids were napping and playing in the other room wrote them here at the kitchen table so now i don't know about you but i have i have trouble uh writing in um so i sometimes i can write at a library but you know a lot of authors a lot of writers go to like coffee shops and stuff i have a lot of trouble writing at coffee shops because i start eavesdropping i start yeah. like people watching and listening to people's conversations i'm just gonna admit it yeah um distractions i can yeah. do it if i take headphones if I take headphones and play some background music, I can do it. If not, no, forget it. But oh my God, I wish I could go to a coffee shop. That sounds so amazing. Yeah, I want to go just to go to the coffee shop if I don't have to write. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm very weird about headphones too. I get paranoid when I'm wearing my headphones. This is a weird thing. Like if I'm wearing headphones that I'm like, okay, if someone comes up behind me, why someone is coming up behind me, I don't know at a coffee shop. But I'm like, if someone comes up behind me, I won't. Be able to hear them. <laughs> I, like I don't know what. It, well, yeah, I don't know. So Noreen asked a great question there, Christina. What books yeah. are you loving right now that that you would recommend? I'm prepared because I was like, somebody's going to ask that, so I'm going to bring so it right smart. From, my, from my bedroom. Um, I started reading "The Only Black Girls in Town" by Brandy Colbert, and it's amazing. It's so wonderful. Um, I highly recommend it. I'm I'm not super far, but it's about a girl, and she's growing up in. I think it's like a Northern California town. It seems like a, a sleepy little like surfing town. And her family is like, she's the only black girl in her grade. And there's a, um, a bed and breakfast across the street that someone, a new family buys. And she's so stoked to learn that it's a black family and a, a, with a girl her age who moves in. So it's awesome. Recommend that. I, I have that on order and it is on the way to me. So I'm very excited because I love Brandy's books. And let's see, books that I recommend. Oh my gosh, why am I not prepared? So um, a few that I would recommend are Manana Land by Pam Munoz Ryan. Of course, she can do no wrong. That's another 
it, it's a quick read, but it's 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 short, but it's packed with a lot of emotion and lyrical prose, which is incredible. Um, and it's another kind of fantasy uh, inspired story, which I loved. Um, Genesis Begins Again, of course, won the won a Newbery Honor. So if you haven't read that, you should read that for sure. And also, oh, I have one more. Um, Coup by Kayla Noel. Oh, yeah. It came out in March of this year. I absolutely love, um, and I would get, pull it off the shelf, but then I have to get up and you'd see my pajama bottom. Uh, <laughs> uh, Coup, Coup by Kayla Noel is so good. It's about a girl who was raised by pigeons on a New York City rooftop. And it is so amazing. Uh, so I highly recommend that. So you're selling you know, order I want an, I have been wanting to read it. So I'm going to pick that one up next. Oh, it's so good. And she's such a wonderful person. One of the last things I did before lockdown was I went to her. See, there I go. Going to events again. But this <laughs> is an actual event that we could do in public. Um, and she had it in Phoenixville, which is like an hour away. So I drove an hour because I was so excited to see Kayla and and support her book and buy a signed copy, you know? Yeah, so that's awesome. Everyone should get it, yes. Okay, well, I wanna thank everybody for coming and particularly our authors for this um, really engaging, wonderful conversation. It's wonderful to see the chemistry between two, the two of you. And thank you also for bringing these wonderful stories full of important themes and hope to all of us. So thank you so much. And thank you, audience. You've been great. Um, I wanted to remind you um, that you can buy both of these books using the green button at the bottom of your, your screen. And if you're able to, to donate to our book donation program, read it forward. Um, and hope to see you again on August 12th at 7 o'clock with Meg Medina and Sarah Marie Jetty. So thank you again so much. And everyone be well and be safe. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.